Welcome back. So we are in this intro sequence on physics-informed machine learning, this super important and exciting intersection between the physical sciences and this emerging set of machine learning optimizations. And we've gone through the kind of five stages of machine learning and how each of these stages gives an opportunity for uh, embedding physics into the process. And today we're going to talk about this fifth stage, uh, actually employing an optimization algorithm to train the machine learning model. Okay, so these are all pretty tightly coupled. Uh, once you decide on what you're going to model, um, deciding on the problem, and you've picked out some data you're going to use to train that model, the next three stages are, are pretty tightly linked. So you usually pick some kind of an architecture you think uh, will give you a good machine learning model. This could be a deep neural network architecture, a generalized linear model. There's a bunch of different architectures. Then you craft a loss function that tells you if you did a good job or not, if your model is good or bad, uh, based on its score on this loss function. And then the last stage is actually employing an optimization algorithm to tune the parameters of the architecture to minimize the loss function averaged over the data. So we're talking about um, all of the different opportunities to uh, embed physics directly in this optimization step. Okay, uh, and this is, um, you know, just an overview. We're going to have more in-depth, detailed uh, follow-on lectures. So this is kind of the high-level uh, overview of this optimization stage here. Good. So um, the first example I want to give, this is uh, kind of my first introduction to how you can marry machine learning with physics constraints and constrained optimization. Uh, and this is work by John Christophe Loazzo um, in Paris. And we started collaborating a while ago. Um, actually, back when he was a, a postdoc at KTH, he reached out to me. Uh, about this Cindy sparse model identification procedure. So I'm going to give you kind of a short abbreviated story about how we can add uh, constrained optimization to the machine learning process to make our models more physical. So what JC realized was that when we're trying to develop a low order machine learning model of a complex system like this fluid flow, Oftentimes we use um, this Cindy modeling procedure where we try to find the fewest columns of theta that add up to equal x dot, y dot, and z dot uh, here. And we do that by finding a sparse coefficient vector C using some sparse optimization procedure. This is uh, kind of now becoming a relatively standard procedure for reduced order modeling of things like fluids. And in the naive or standard approach to Cindy modeling of this fluid, you would have some kind of a model error that you're trying to minimize. You're going to minimize you know, the error of your model. Maybe you'll have some sparsity term in this loss function to promote sparsity of the coefficients in C. But this is kind of the standard naive way to do it. And what JC realized and uh, built into this procedure is that we know a ton about the physics of these incompressible fluid flows that we are kind of not including in just this uh, loss function alone. So instead of only uh, trying to find the coefficients C that are sparse and give us low model error, what JC pointed out was because of the incompressibility of this fluid flow from first principles, we can derive a set of constraint equations that have to be true for any model that we get of this incompressible fluid flow. These 10 constraint equations should be satisfied for energy conservation to hold. Okay, so this is a really, really important observation JC made, uh, is that you know, any incompressible fluid flow we're working with, you're going to get this type of uh, set of equality constraints. And you can add those as, as, as terms in, uh, in your loss function. So you can have your model error, and you can have terms that quantify your, uh, whether or not those constraints are being satisfied, whether or not your system is conserving energy. And remember, this lecture is about the optimization algorithms, the opportunity to bake physics into the optimization algorithms. So what JC did was he went one step farther, and instead of just deriving the constraints and adding them to the loss function, 
he showed that you can actually do a uh, constrained least squares optimization so that you are exactly minimizing this error subject to these constraints. So instead of just adding them to the loss function so that you're you know, promoting those constraints being satisfied or suggesting that your model is energy conserving, what he does is through this KKT key KKT constrained least squares, he's able to exactly satisfy the constraints and minimize this model error. So I think that's a way more powerful approach when you know exact equality constraints and you're doing some kind of a least squares, uh, you know, model error fitting, this can be a really, really nice approach. And we've built on this and extended this into lots of other fluid models and uh, Cindy models and sparse models. Uh, where you have these kinds of constraints. So really, really important. If we only added this as a term in the loss function, these two terms would be battling each other, and you might get a model that's not exactly energy conserving and uh, doesn't have great model error because they're going to be kind of fighting each other. But when you do this constrained optimization procedure, when you build it directly into the optimization procedure, you are minimizing the error and exactly satisfying those constraints. Really, really powerful idea. Okay. Uh, another area that has come up a lot in terms of uh, changing the, the optimization algorithm to improve uh, the machine learning procedure is in this physics informed dynamic mode decomposition developed by Peter Badu et al. And that should be a single L all, not. Uh, all y'all. Uh, and so this is kind of a cool example. There's gonna, I think there's a whole video already um, that, that Peter filmed uh, about physics informed DMD. So I'll put a link to it. That's, you know, you can watch the whole thing. I'm just gonna give the, the thumbnail recap is that sometimes if you are trying to build a, a dynamical systems model of a particular um, data set from a known set of physics, like in this case, we're looking at, you know, quantum oscillations in a, in a hexagonal potential. We know certain things about how those models should behave from the physics, just like JC showed us that we have these, you know, constraints that have to be true for energy conservation in a fluid. We know, for example, that this physics uh, should be Hermitian. There is a certain type of symmetry that these models should have just based on the form of the governing equations. So even if I'm doing a data-driven model, a machine learning model, I still want that model to have those basic symmetries. I want this Hermitian symmetry. And so there's a lot of ways of promoting this. Actually, Peter showed that you could add a term in the loss function to promote that kind of symmetry. But he also showed that in a lot of cases, you can directly constrain the optimization to only be searching over the space of Hermitian models. So this is the ground truth in the first row. These are kind of the, the eigenmodes of this system. Uh, the naive or standard DMD approach that does not bake in this symmetry into the optimization is the bottom. You can see it's pretty noisy and not that great. And pi DMD, physics informed DMD, where Peter is directly constraining the optimization to search over her mission models, does a much, much better job of capturing the true uh, eigenstructure of the system. So baking in that symmetry directly into the optimization algorithm dramatically improves the model performance. Uh, so classic DMD, this kind of bottom row here, is also actually doing, um, you know, it's adding some physics into the optimization algorithm itself. So if you look at what the DMD is doing, it's essentially trying to find a best fit linear model A that maps the state x to its derivatives x dot. So in this case, y would be the time derivative of x, x dot. Uh, and we're doing this, you'll notice that the optimization is searching over rank R matrices. Uh, so all of the A matrices that DMD is searching over are constrained to have rank R, a low rank structure. And so this is already adding some physics into that optimization procedure. We're constraining our optimization to search over a subset of models uh, of matrices A. What Peter Badu's physics informed DMD does is it essentially changes the space of matrices that our algorithm is searching over. And so this is a constrained optimization where we are essentially constraining our search to a particular manifold of matrices uh, called curly M.
Now this is kind of a mathematical topic. We're going to get into what it means to have a matrix manifold and a constrained optimization like the actual algorithms later. But I wanted to show this parallel in case you're familiar with regular DMD. This isn't that different. We're just changing the kind of uh, constrained optimization space. And so uh, Peter called that physics informed DMD. Uh, and there are a ton of types of symmetries and constraints that different physics have that we might want to incorporate into this Pi DMD framework. So um, some physics is self-adjoint, some physics is shift invariant, meaning the physics is the same here or if you translate it here. Like lots of things are translationally invariant. Uh, there's conservative or unitary uh, dynamics. And in each case, what you can do is you can come up with a, an exact optimization procedure to find the best uh, matrix A, the best dynamical systems model A, linear dynamics A, constrained to live in one of these spaces or you know, matrix manifolds. So you can search over all self-adjoint matrices and minimize this cost function. Or you can search over all uh, tri-diagonal matrices and minimize this cost function. And that's directly a constrained optimization because we're constraining our optimization to live on some either subspace or submanifold. Um, out of all of the spaces of possible matrices, there's a submanifold that are tridiagonal. There's a submanifold that are circulant or symmetric. And so this essentially is a set of optimization algorithms that allows you to bake that physics directly into the procedure. Um, so there's these kind of nice takeaways here. You can incorporate known physics by constraining the model to a physics-informed manifold. And uh, again, I think Peter's uh, point in this paper was that you can actually solve these optimization problems exactly in a lot of cases. And when you can't solve them exactly, you can add um, a penalty to the loss function to promote that symmetry. Um, kind of a cool thing, again, you can watch this video that Peter made, um, but the, the mathematical optimization problem that allows us to, to restrict to these matrix manifolds is called a Procrustis problem. Um, and this is actually based, it's, here's the optimization problem here. Um, it's exactly what we wrote for the DMD case. And it's actually related to this kind of uh, Greek myth of uh, Procustes, um, there is essentially some, you know, victim that is being constrained to um, sleep on a bed of a particular length. And so, um, you know, either if he's too long, maybe his legs get cut off, or if he's too short, maybe he gets stretched to fit the bed. Um, it's kind of a cartoon that we're going to basically be trying to warp these solutions to live on some kind of a manifold, to live on this, uh, this kind of a manifold. Anyway, kind of a cool cartoon, interesting history. Uh, Peter explained it way better in his video. But again, the, the, the idea here, remember we're talking about physics-informed machine learning. What we're trying to do first is we interpret what we mean by physics as a mathematical expression. Okay? And so that physics could be translation invariant or you know, shift invariant. It could be rotationally invariant. It could be some quantum mechanical symmetry that we have or, or something more general than that. It could be those um, energy-conserving symmetries that JC wrote down. So once you have this uh, mathematical expression, you map that to a particular structure that your model has to satisfy, either you know, being in a certain matrix manifold or if satisfying these equality constraints. And then you design an optimization algorithm to solve the optimization constrained to satisfy this structure. This is a super general idea. This is you know, applicable to neural networks and all kinds of um, you know, uh, machine learning architectures. Good. So we talked about uh, equality constraints in Cindy to promote energy conservation, these physics-informed constraints in DMD to promote all kinds of known physics. Um, and so what we talked about in the Cindy case where JC wrote down those 10 equality constraints Essentially, what that amounts to is in this high dimensional search space of possible models, remember our architecture, our machine learning architecture is a space of functions we're searching over to get a good model. A model is just an input output function. And we're searching over this space of models. 
JC's equality constraints essentially gives us a subspace in that space of models where we want our models to live. So a set of equality constraints defines a subspace and we want our models to live on that subspace. Peter Badu's physics-informed DMD oftentimes is constraining us to a uh, a submanifold. So out of all of the spaces of those, those matrices we're searching over, uh, certain matrices that satisfy you know, a symmetric property or a toplitz property or a tridiagonal property, those will form a curved submanifold in the subset of all functions or models. And so again, um, these are very, very general pictures. Almost any constraint you can think of is either going to be a linear constraint or a manifold constraint. Linear constraints often have uh, easy, exact, closed form solutions like that KKT optimization. But actually, in a lot of cases, I didn't know this until uh, Peter showed us, you know, the Percusti's problem. Oftentimes, submanifold constraints often also have exact solutions. So it's not out of the question that you could solve both of these, you know, uh, by designing an optimization algorithm to keep you on this submanifold or subspace. Now you could add a loss term that's totally legit. Um, you could just you know pr promote trying to be on the submanifold or subspace by adding a term to the loss function. So this is my you know typical uh, L2 error loss function. Um, y hat is my machine learning prediction. Y is the true output um, from the training data set. And I can just add a term here that basically computes the distance of my you know, my model prediction to that model prediction projected onto this manifold. So you can totally just add a loss function here um, to promote, to kind of shrink wrap your solutions onto this manifold uh, through this loss term. But often there are directly ways of actually changing your minimization, your optimization algorithm directly to, to constrain yourself to live on that manifold or to constrain yourself to live on that subspace. It is often more human intensive, it's more work to design a new optimization algorithm or to find an optimization algorithm that's custom uh, designed for this particular constraint. But this is generally speaking a much better way of promoting that physics. Like you're guaranteed if you do it this way that your solution will live on this manifold. Whereas if you just add this loss function, you're only promoting that you should get close to the manifold and you might not be exactly on it. So with a loss function, you're not exactly satisfying your constraints. With constrained optimization, you are exactly satisfying your constraints. So whenever I can, I like to live down here. And this is really something, again, I learned from you know, Jean-Christophe Loiseau and Peter Badu uh, and others that these um, you know, constraint problems you can actually solve with optimization. Good. Um, and again, this idea of constraining your solution to live on a particular manifold comes up a ton when we think of symmetries. So we already saw this in physics-informed DMD, but this idea is much more general. Um, symmetry is one of the main ways that we encode known physics. Oftentimes physics is, uh, you know, partial knowledge of the physics comes in the form of knowing some symmetry that your system must uh, adhere to. And even if I just observe my data, sometimes I can see from looking at the data that there is some symmetry in the data. Again, that often gives me an idea of how to constrain my model, like what space, either subspace or submanifold, um, does that symmetry constrain my model to live on. So again, this is just a cartoon, um, and we're going to have like a whole section on symmetries and machine learning. But this idea of constrained optimization is going to be critical when we think of enforcing uh, symmetries. And Sam Otto, who at the moment of, of um, filming this lecture is a postdoc uh, at our AI Institute working with Nathan Kutz and myself, Sam wrote a really cool paper essentially discussing how you can enforce, promote, and discover symmetries in machine learning models. So enforcing means through direct constraints, promoting means through adding loss functions, and discovering means something different. Sometimes you can discover symmetries you didn't know your system had. Um, and I'll put a link to that video, uh, to that paper, and I think Sam's gonna make a bunch of videos on, on symmetry uh, in machine learning. 
Good. Um, okay, so other areas where optimization comes up. Again, this is just a high-level topical overview, so this is not exhaustive. This is just things that came to my mind that I thought I could use to kind of give you a flavor of what it means to optimize um, and incorporate physics into that optimization procedure. Um, one of the really interesting areas of machine learning research, um, at least I think it's super interesting, is called symbolic regression. Oftentimes in the past literature, it's called uh, genetic programming or evolutionary algorithms. Um, PySer is a symbolic regression package in Python developed by Miles Cranmer, and it's currently like the best state-of-the-art version of genetic programming for model discovery. So you can feed in data from experiments or simulations into this procedure and it will learn things like differential equations or conservation laws that will describe that data. It's super cool. And the expressions are typically more interpretable than a neural network. Uh, and people have been doing this for a while. So um, Bongard and uh, Han Libsyn and Schmidt and Libsyn. Uh, and others have been using genetic programming and symbolic regression to discover models for you know, at least the last couple of decades. My point being, symbolic regression is kind of an architecture. You're using uh, compositional function trees to represent your function, so this is kind of the space uh, of functions, your architecture. There is definitely a loss function you're minimizing uh, to train these, uh, these genetic programming trees. But the way that you actually get the model is through this really interesting evolutionary optimization algorithm where you actually do kind of a, a guided trial and error search. You try a bunch of trees to represent your function. The ones that perform well, you kind of breed them or evolve them into future generations through things like crossover of genetic information, mutations, uh, cloning, things like that. And so my point being that implicit to all of this genetic programming and genetic algorithms and symbolic regression oftentimes is based on a really interesting and very different form of optimization than what we typically think of when we think of machine learning. We're used to thinking of things like least squares, stochastic gradient descent, things like that. This is a whole different set of optimization algorithms that is you know, designed to guide this architecture to find the right model. So again, we'll talk more about this later, but you know, it just occurred to me this morning, like, hey, this is actually, uh, you know, you're baking physics into this optimization algorithm, um, you know, by, by promoting these kind of functional blocks. Okay, good. Um, and I think this is the last segment in this optimization uh, section because, again, we're going to you know, go into lots of detail on this optimization. I think there's going to be a whole class, a whole boot camp on, on optimization. Um, another notion of, of what is physics that we can incorporate into our machine learning model is that physics models, models that capture the essential physic of, physics of a system, tend to be as simple as possible uh, to describe the data and no simpler. So that's this, uh, this Einstein quote. If you want your machine learning model to be interpretable and generalizable and kind of capture the physics of the system, typically we achieve that by making our model as simple as possible to describe the data and no simpler. This is the principle of parsimony in physics and it's also a very important principle in machine learning. And the way we do that is often through these two uh, kind of ideas of I want my model to be low dimensional, I don't want it to have a ton of free parameters, and I want it to be sparse. If I'm writing down like a differential equation, if I'm, if I'm machine learning a differential equation to de describe some time series data, then I would like that differential equation to only have a few terms, to be as sparse um, as possible. And these are quantified by the L2 norm and the L1 norm. And both of these norms, there are explicit optimization algorithms and procedures to minimize these norms. Okay, so that, that's kind of where I'm trying to get to is that this is another way we incorporate or promote physics in machine learning is through uh, clever uses of low dimensionality and sparsity. And low dimensionality and sparsity often have, you know, custom optimization algorithms to solve these problems. 
So um, this is just a cartoon to show what these different norms look like, um, L2 norm and L1 norm. Like I have a whole, I think chapter three of our textbook, you know, talks a lot about these different norms and their geometry. Uh, but there are optimization algorithms to find the minimum L1 norm solution or the minimum L2 norm solution of a problem. And those are, you know, there's actually dozens of algorithms to find the minimum, you know, the most sparse solution uh, to a problem. We've come up with our own uh, and, you know, there's a bunch of them out there and they have different properties. So that's uh, important is the optimization actually plays a major role in solving these problems. Uh, so, for example, in the, the Cindy sparse model identification procedure, so this is something, you know, again, I talk a lot about because it's something we think a lot about, is one of our tasks in machine learning uh, is to discover new physics and new differential equations from measurement data. So if I had measurement data, I could use this uh, library regression procedure to discover a differential equation that describes the data. And the optimization problem I would be trying to solve is to find the fewest columns of theta. These are candidate terms that could be in my differential equation. And remember, I want my differential equation to be sparse because I want the simplest model that describes the data and no simpler. So I'm trying to find the fewest columns of theta that add up to equal x dot, y dot, and z dot. And in this case, fewest columns of theta means I want this coefficient matrix C to be as sparse as possible. I want it to have a really small either L0 norm or L1 norm. And we have to use optimization to find that sparse model solution. Uh, again, so argmin of LX, if we're doing some, you know, if we have some loss function that quantifies that I want a good model fit and I want uh, a sparse set of model coefficients, I could, um, you know, I could solve for a least squares loss function. I could solve for a ridge regression loss function. I could solve for a lasso or an elastic net. Each of these have different custom optimization algorithms uh, to solve for that solution. So least squares actually has a known kind of closed form solution to this problem. I would compute the SVD of my matrix and do a pseudo inverse. Like I know how to solve least squares problems. Um, sparse solutions like lasso are, there are optimization algorithms to find, you know, the sparsest matrix C that uh, gives me a good model error. And we've come up with our own sparse optimization algorithms for this problem in particular. So, um, you know, this is kind of a cartoon of how the lasso algorithm, you know, finds a sparse solution to a problem. This is supposed to represent the minimum L1 norm uh, radius. And working with Peng Zhang, uh, Travis, Travis Ashkam, uh, Nathan Kutz, and Sasha Aravkin, we essentially cooked up a new optimization algorithm that finds these sparse solutions more efficiently and more accurately. So I don't know if you can see these blue dots here. The blue dots indicate how many iterations of the optimization it has to go through before it finds the sparse solution. Uh, using traditional methods, you need a lot of optimization iterations to get to the solution. Using this new kind of SR3 algorithm, you almost immediately go to the optimal solution. And it's better conditioned and so on. Again, the details of this are not about this algorithm, just that when you're solving for a sparse model in general, under the hood, kind of implicit in that statement is you're going to need some optimization algorithm to solve for that, that loss function. And it's not just going to be a stochastic gradient descent or at least squares. You're going to need like a custom algorithm sometimes for a custom term in the loss function. So we think about sparsity a lot. And so we have custom optimization algorithms to promote sparsity. Okay, I think that was the main point I wanted to get across. Uh, and, you know, in general, when we do something like Cindy or, you know, really any modeling procedure, this also works for the symbolic regression um, I showed you before, we're doing some optimization. I'm trying to sometimes optimize over hyperparameters. Maybe this lambda is a knob I get to turn uh, to get more or less sparse models. So, for example, if I'm trying to find a sweet spot in terms of error and complexity for my machine learning model, remember the simplest model that describes the data and no simpler, uh, if I have lambda equals infinity, then I'm going to get underfit models, models with no terms, um, really, really bad error. 
if I have lambda zero, I'm gonna have uh, overfit models kind of way over there, very, very complex. And as I sweep through this hyperparameter lambda, I'm going to find this Pareto curve of models. And if I cross validate those models on a, a withhold or, or test data set, I'll find that I actually you know, get this kind of typical learning curve that we're used to seeing. And the models we want are kind of at this minimum of this validated error. So again, at the end of the day, everything we're doing in machine learning, kind of all of it, boils down to an optimization problem. We are finding solutions uh, that minimize a loss function. That is an optimization problem, okay? Oftentimes, that optimization problem, we can kind of take it for granted. It's a commodity algorithm like least squares. You don't really have to think about what's happening in your computer when you do a least squares, a pseudo inverse least squares. When you train a neural network uh, with something like Atom, you know, some stochastic gradient descent algorithm, usually we kind of offload or abstract that optimization because some really smart people made it work really well and I don't have to think about what's happening under the hood that much. But sometimes you'll actually need custom algorithms to promote, um, oh yeah, some references here uh, to these, these, uh, these papers. Sometimes you're going to need custom algorithms to promote a certain type of constraint or to work with a certain type of loss function like this L0 loss function or to sweep through a certain hyperparameter to find the best uh, cross-validated models. Okay, so that's really, I guess, what I'm getting at here is that all of this procedure really rests at the end on finding a good optimization algorithm to actually minimize your loss function by tweaking the parameters of your architecture. A lot of the time, sometimes the majority of the time, you can kind of abstract away that optimiza optimization step. It's just, you know, one line uh, and it's kind of under the hood doing some fancy optimization or some really well characterized optimization. You don't have to worry about it. But sometimes it's actually the best way to, you know, incorporate physics through constrained optimization um, or, you know, physics or symmetry, things like that. And sometimes uh, you actually have to develop a custom optimization algorithm because of some fancy loss function that you're trying to minimize. Even not that fancy, like we wanna you know, promote sparsity through our loss function. We have custom optimization algorithms to promote sparsity, okay, better, because that's so important to us. Okay, lots of opportunities to embed physics in the optimization stage. This is typically the most human intensive. This could be like a whole PhD to come up with a new optimization algorithm, but it is oftentimes kind of the gold standard in uh, enforcing physics. So, you know, crafting a loss function, you're promoting physics. Employing an optimization to const a constrained optimization, you're enforcing that physics, and that's like usually a more stringent, uh, a more stringent type uh, of embedding physics. Okay, thank you. <laughs>